opportunity to give your name glory we thank you for all the promises that you've given us promise of healing promise of deliverance promise of prosperity God we receive them all because your word declares that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Jesus Christ so we thank you for it we thank you for establishing our hearts so that we can love one another. God, we thank you for that. We thank you now, God, for giving us an opportunity to show forth your glory, to let the world know that not only can we live saved, but we can also lead you into salvation. So we thank you for it. We thank you now, God, for your soon coming return. Let your kingdom come as your will is being done in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Wonderful morning. Wonderful morning. Hallelujah. When there is excitement in the air, we know that God is already up to something. We just need to catch up to what he's doing. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, you go to 2 Peter. We were there last week. Almost got through a portion of what we needed to do. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 5 says, but also for this very reason, and that's what you see between verses 1 and 4, he says, giving all diligence, add to your virtue, uh, to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. And then he goes on to say, for if these things are yours and abound, you will neither, uh, you need, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to add one more verse from last week. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Amen. So this morning I want to continue to talk to you on supplementing your faith. Supplementing your faith. Amen. And you can be seated this morning. So rather than go through and review all the things that we talked about, which is a lot, let's just pick up the seven virtues that we were looking at. I got to number three, but I'm going to go one and two again. So you'll all be caught up. The first one he said is godliness. That is living to glorify God, living to glorify God. Every now and then you need to ask yourself that question. Is my life, is my lifestyle, is it glorifying God? Amen. When people see what I'm doing, how I'm living, do they give glory to God? Amen. If folks are giving you the glory, then you're not living right. Amen. Amen. The Bible goes on to say this. He says that uh, the second characteristic is knowledge. And the Bible says that is responding to divine revelation. Now, just knowing stuff 
doesn't make you knowledgeable. But to be able to respond to revelation, that means that you have a connection with God so that when you hear something that is godly, you can respond to the thing that you heard. Not everybody is in position to do that. That's why people will receive knowledge and then will apply it to their own edification rather than building up the kingdom. Amen. The Bible says that it does not come from intellectual pursuits, but spiritual knowledge comes through the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you don't have knowledge. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the truth. And the truth is the only thing that will make you free. Amen. And then the third one, we think we stop right here, but self-control, self-control. We say that is resisting sinful desires. Now, you're going to need this one. Hmm? Anywhere from wandering eyes to a scrumptious dinner table. Uh, some people don't have the ability to push back, right? Push away. I understand. I do understand. I, I get tempted myself. Amen. So this means resisting, when it says resisting sinful desires, it means that my passions are subjugated to reason. My passions are subjugated to reason. What does that mean? That means that, uh, you know, when the Bible says think on these things, when I'm tempted, I have to think on these things. Uh, I have to reason out that mm, that's not going to work for me. Amen. Now, I'll tell you something. I'll be honest with you. It would be nice if I would be able to stand up here and tell you that every time you ran into an obstacle and you overcame that obstacle, that you had enough self-control never to go back there again. But then I'd be lying to you. Amen. Amen. You know how many times you've been on a diet? You started out losing five pounds. You done lost that five pounds so many times, now you got to lose 25 to get the five back. <laughs> Talking about self-control here. <laughs> It means to, t <laughs> really, you know, it's like the old guy used to say uh, when he was smoking cigarettes, say, I can stop any time I want. I don't stop 15 times. <laughs> so the Bible teaches us this. It is the ability to take a grip of oneself. This is what's called perfect temperance. Perfect temperance. What does that mean, perfect temperance? Uh, the Bible calls that patience. Mm. That brings us to number four, perseverance. Perseverance, not quitting until God releases you. Perseverance is not quitting until God releases you. One more time. Perseverance is not quitting until God releases you. You remember when I told you last week that these things are not in order? But it depends on the individual and what you're dealing with. Huh? If this is not one of your top two, you're going to have a problem anyway, because if you quit stuff, you never get stuff. I know. That's a hood ram, but, but it works. But you do understand that, it, that, that if, you, if you start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, then you never get the thing that God has appropriated for you. So perseverance is not quitting until God releases you. There comes a point in time when you have weathered the storm, you've gone through the trial, and God says, okay, I'm going to move you to the next level. You're getting promoted spiritually. That's the time that you can move on. Amen. But everybody knows, everybody knows, I think everybody knows, you can't leave until you have a 
Replacement. Yeah, y'all scared to say it. No, if you haven't properly trained someone to fill your spot, you'll be there forever. Hmm? No, seriously. Amen. If you have not trained your successor, that means you have to stay there until you die. Jesus. And since that's not my message, I'm going to move away from that uh, a little bit. One of the things that he says uh, uh, with, with perseverance is that uh, <laughs> it's a constancy or steadfast endurance under adversity. Amen. Under what? Adversity. If it's easy, yes. listen now. If it's easy, he ain't God. Amen. <laughs> if there's no test attached to the task, that's not God. Otherwise, you would never have a testimony. Do we understand that? Somebody says it's easy as falling off a log. Well, unless you learn how to get up, you're going to drown. Amen. Then there's godliness, number five. All right. All right, I'm back. Okay. I had to beat myself in the back to get started again, huh? <laughs> I heard one man say they, they, they charge you for everything now, you know, how they charge you for water. So the next thing you know, that everybody will be charged for air. So you'll be walking along, somebody will be talking to you, and all of a sudden go, I said, what's wrong with him? He didn't pay his air bill. <laughs> oh, that mercy. <laughs> what am I talking about? Godliness. <laughs> Seeking to please God with your choices. Seeking to please God with your choices. It refers to man's obligation of reverence toward God. In other words, everything I do, I do to please him. And if I believe that he's not pleased with what I'm doing, then what I'm doing is wrong. Now, that's where we have to, to come to the place where we understand what sin is. Huh? When I get to the place where what I'm doing is not pleasing to God, that's sin. I don't care if I'm doing a good deed. Hmm? A good deed out of season. <laughs> Number six is brotherly kindness. That's caring for the well-being of other members of God's family. When we talk about brotherly love, Philadelphia, the Bible talks about how we treat others. Now, this is, this, this, this is extremely important because we have to understand that there are more people in the world than us. Amen. Amen. So the Bible says that uh, the first five virtues pertain to one's inner life and his relationship to God. But these last two, uh, brotherly kindness and love, they relate to, to others. And the Bible says that when, when we talk about Caring for others, that should be our primary concern. I can't be okay if you're not. Huh? John chapter 4, uh, 1 John, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 20 says this. If someone says, I love you, and hates his brother, he's a liar. Let me write that, try that one more time. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, then he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God? And we love 
loving on an invisible God. We have a hard time loving on visible people, especially when they are not of our statue. Amen. And the strange thing, <laughs> oh, Lord, how we view people is relative. Huh? Sometimes when we look at people, we think that we are so much better than they are. Until we meet somebody who's better than we. <laughs> and we find out real soon that well, maybe I don't have it all together. I tell people all the time, I did not know I was poor till I went in the army. I thought everybody lived the way we live. <laughs> I was talking, I mean, you know, after you get out of basic training, you know, how people be talking about where they live and what they do. And somebody said something about their room. I said, you got a room? <laughs> I knew right then something's, something's up here. <laughs> you got a room? <laughs> you own, just you? <laughs> and then number seven, y'all. The Bible says love. <clears throat> that means compassionately and righteously seeking the well-being of others, including non-believers. Now, the reason we have to add the agape to brotherly love is because if you say, I only love my brother, then you are narrowing down the field by saying, only people who have like beliefs as I are worthy of my love. But you must learn how to love unbelievers so that they can become believers. Amen. The Bible says this is the highest type of love. It's a gift of God. Nobody can love with agape unless they have the Holy Spirit. If Christ is not in you, you can't. Show forth the love of Christ. Amen. That means you have what's called a temporary love. Amen. It works as long as everything is working for you. But Romans 5 and 5 says this kind of love is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the Bible says then that uh, this agape love is desiring the highest good for others. These qualities, we, this is how we got the topic, act like vitamin supple supplements. When you look at the seven virtues, they are like supplementing uh, the things that we need to grow in faith. Now, if you don't have these things, it becomes a problem. Amen. But let's look at what the scripture says. Now, I like what verse 8 says. Verse 8 says that... <clears throat> uh, if these things are yours and abound. And didn't just say you had these seven things. If you have them in abundance. You all understand what I'm saying? So if, they, if you have these uh, uh, qualities, they must be in increasing measures, which means that e each one of these qualities must grow every day in your life. He yes. said so not, they will not be, uh, if, if you have these, you will not be useless or unfruitful in the knowledge uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. A growing Christian produces spiritual fruit that God uses to bless others. Let me say it again. A growing Christian produces spiritual fruit that God uses to bless others. If you're not producing anything, then you can't help anybody. That's why so many people are, are more concerned about their own stuff. They just want more and more stuff. And I don't know when you get enough stuff. And when you get it, how do you know you got enough? Huh? And then when you die, what happens to the stuff that you had to have? Isn't that amazing? 
You work your whole life with this one thing in mind. And then you get it and you die. Now, don't let me tell you what the children are going to do with it. You're going to be one mad brother or sister when you see what they do with it. They don't want to know the history. They don't want to know about the hard work. You know what they want to know? How much is this work? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about somebody else's church. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why the certain now, never mind. I'm ready to go someplace. I don't need to go there. <laughs> But, you know, some of us have reached that age where you say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to enjoy some stuff. <laughs> I'm going to have a little fun here. Let me go on. <laughs> Stop laughing. Okay. Now, these qualities must be produced by the Holy Spirit. If they're not produced by the Holy Spirit, then they won't benefit anybody but you. And if they're only benefiting you, it will be a temporary benefit. Amen. The Bible says that uh, if you are in Christ, these things are part of your genetic structure. The Bible says that it's already there. God wants uh, us to be conformed to his image. Notice Romans 8:29. Uh, says, for whom he foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. But Colossians now says this in 2 and 10. Uh, it's not in your notes, but you can look it up. It says that you are complete in him who is the head of all things. You are complete in him. Now, what does that mean? That means that what, when, when Peter writes here in the uh, beginning of this, he says to those who have obtained like precious faith with us. That's the first clue. And then look at verse 3, he says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But you only get those how? The Bible says, through the knowledge of him who called us. Amen. Now I'll talk about who called you next week. But you can ponder that question. Who called you? <laughs> Amen. Uh, I sure want to get there, but I'm going to go on. Now, the one thing that I want you to have in mind is this. The Bible says, uh, as the knowledge of Christ is reproduced in us, the process that God takes us through does not destroy our own personality. Amen. Mm-mm. Listen to me. There's something distinctive about you that is different from every other human being on the face of the earth, including identical twins. Are you listening to me? There's something different. God has given you a personality. That's a distinctiveness that nobody else has. That should not change because you grow to be like Christ. What the Bible says is that if you are part of a family, people know that you are part of that family. People tell me all the time, I look like my daddy, but I don't have his personality. So when people see me, they say, oh, he's in that family. But I'm not him. I don't do what he did the way he did what he did. So what am I saying to you? That when we become a part of the family of God, the Bible says that we have our own distinct personality that you shouldn't change just because you get saved. People should look at your character and say, that's a Christian. I know he's a part of Christ's family, but you shouldn't try to look like Jesus. What am I saying? Don't be an imitation. Don't try to be like, you know, Pastor P.O. You can't be like me. Amen. I, listen, you don't know what I went through to be me. And you wouldn't like going through what I went through to become me. 
Amen. Amen. Come on now. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. My life, my experience is, is distinctly mine. Which means that every test and trial that God put me through was for me so that I could become what he wanted me to be. Amen. Now, if I try to be like my favorite preacher or, or somebody on TV, then what I do is I destroy what God has created. You, listen, you can, you can destroy the gift of God that's in you by trying to be somebody else. Hmm? You can't get in front of the mirror and try to practice your preaching. Come on. Because now that's not you preaching. That's whoever it is you're trying to imitate. And see, Christians have this thing that when we get saved, all of a sudden we change. Oh, Lord, I got to get past this. When we get saved, all of a sudden we got our head in the air and we are so, you know, we don't laugh anymore. Somebody, you know, somebody tells you a joke. <laughs> Come on. You don't know how many times I've been criticized because I'm always telling jokes. Shouldn't be laughing in church. Well, where should you laugh? You come in with your little sourpuss face on. Nice. Come on, help me get past this Holy Spirit. I'm simply saying <laughs> that you can't be who God called you to be when you're trying to be somebody else. Do we understand that? I think sometimes we, 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 we get to that place where we just think that certain forms of, of speech, some, uh, uh, our, our uh, uh, deportment uh, uh, or the dress, it makes us saved. Doesn't make you saved. What makes you saved is your belief in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sin and that he rose again. You have to believe that. Anything else, that's you. Amen. Amen. If you knew me 30, 40, 50 years ago, I was exactly the same one. Amen. Why is that? Let me tell you why. Because I firmly believe that I can't be genuine in what I tell you if I can't be genuinely me. I don't know how to dress it up. I'm not good at that because you won't get it. Most of my references are going to be about the hood because I know about the hood. Amen. But it, I wasn't called to the other crowd, so they don't have to get my references. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> A believer who does not progress in these seven areas is ineffective. The Bible says that word ineffective means idle or useless. He's unproductive. That means unfruitful. And, and that means that he doesn't grow in his knowledge of who Christ is. That's why ten, the Second Timothy says this in chapter 3, uh, verse 7, that you're ever learning and never coming into a knowledge of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means you know some stuff, but the stuff you know is about Christ, but you don't know Christ personally. And, and the reason I say that is because you don't know, well, know him well enough for him to have an effect on your life. Hmm? Can I give you a quick example? It's like going to church. Huh? What does that mean? If you say you love the Lord, you don't just go to church. Come on. You see going to church as an obligation of being saved. Okay, I'm messing you up now, right? Because there's no way I can go all week 
with all the goodness of the Lord. Come on. I spent seven days being blessed. But I can't take two hours to come in and tell him thank you. So then when I say it becomes an obligation, I don't mean that I am pressed to do it. It becomes a want to. I'm excited about it because God has been so good to me for these last six days that I can't help but get to the place where I give him some glory on the seventh. Well, Pastor, you don't know what I had, what kind of night I had. I don't care. No, 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 no. Now, when I say I don't care, I don't mean that recklessly. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter what your reason for not being there is. There should be a desire in you to want to be there. Even if you listen, even if you're in the hospital, you should want to be here. As a matter of fact, if I was in the hospital on Sunday morning, I would certainly want to be here. When I was in the hospital, I remember uh, I was there for five days and I told the doctor, I got to be out of here on Sunday. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't walk, couldn't hardly walk, couldn't talk. But I said, I got to be out of here on Sunday. He said, why? I said, I don't be missing church. <laughs> he said, let's see if we can't get him out of here. <laughs> I was in the hospital, uh, not in the hospital. I shouldn't say that. I had some minor surgery a couple of months ago. And uh, I was talking to the, the uh, anesthesiologist. And he was talking about what they were going to do. And they talked about putting a tube down my throat and all kinds of stuff. And, and he says, well, there may be some tenderness and you may have some rasping. And I said, Doc, I got to be in church Sunday and I'm the preacher. <laughs> he said, uh, well, I don't know. He says, let, let, me, let me talk to the surgeon. And I said, well, you talk to him. The first thing that I remember when the doctor, when they woke me up, the doctor said, they told me you had to preach on Sunday. <laughs> and that was on, I think, Thursday, wasn't it? It was on Thursday. Yeah, it was on a Thursday. I said, okay. And see, y'all don't even know when I had the surgery. That's right, because I made sure. I'm here on, thir- on, 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 on Sunday. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm not saying and I'm not saying that 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 everybody has to be zealous about that. What I'm saying is that's me. That's me. That's me has absolutely nothing to do with you. But I know that these seven virtues are important. So I try to build on them so that when it comes to the time that I need to be able to do what God has called me to do, I want to be there. I want to. Oh, yeah. Let me move on because I got to jump some of this. So look at scriptures in uh, First Corinthians chapter three and one that talks about carnal Christians needing to grow up. And then look at Hebrews chapter five, verses 12 and 13. Amen. So Peter urges us to grow up. And that's where Second Peter three and 18 tells us we need to grow up. Y'all get all them. Let me do it one more time. <laughs> First Corinthians three and one. Amen. <laughs> then uh, in Hebrews. Chapter five, verses 12 and 13. All right. I put them up for you. OK. And then uh, in Second Peter 318. He says, if these things are yours and abound and there's that word again, abound. You will neither be barren nor unfruitful. All right, now, oh, that scripture is wrong. It says 2 Second Peter 1 and 18, it should be 3 18. Anyway, y'all know what it says. 
So let me move on and get to this, this next part because I need to get to this before next week. To grow these qualities, we must practice them in our daily life. You got to put forth the effort to use these every day. The Bible says that uh, as they increase, they keep believers from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus. Ineffective means idle and slowful. Literally, this means out of work. Hmm? A saint should never be out of work. You should not be an unemployed saint. I'm not talking about your secular job. I'm talking about your job as a saint. You should always, you shouldn't be drawing unemployment. <laughs> and again, I'm talking about your calling. You should be working constantly. The Bible says, <laughs> see, somebody's going to take that out of context. This is a parallel to, to James 2.20 when it says faith without works is dead. In other words, if you're not exercising any faith, you don't have no job in the kingdom. Amen. Are you understanding this? Unfruitful means barren or unproductive. Barren or unproductive. Now, when the Bible says you're a, 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 a light, uh, when you're barren or unproductive, it means that your life is crowded with pleasures and cure, uh, uh, cures, cares. And the reason that your life is, is, is so full of stuff is because you're so busy doing stuff. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, it says, Now those who receive the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes what? Unfruitful. Listen, you can work so hard. That you work yourself right out of Christ. Busy doing non-productive things. Amen. That's why when I hear saints say, well, I, I got these bills. I got to get a second job, so I won't be in church. No, 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 no. I tell you, I, 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 mm, no, no, just no. <laughs> because what you're doing now is you're cutting off the very mechanism that's necessary to get you out of debt. Do you understand that? Yes, I know you have to have a job. Everybody ought to work. But you say, well, but pastor, I, I got to have a second job because I got these bills. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Can we talk? About <laughs> Here I go being me again, right? It means that you didn't, you didn't know how to manage. Because you had more bills than you could pay. You had no self-restraint. You got in debt that you couldn't handle. See, every now and then you have to have, you know, some common sense. If I bought a car, lost my job, and I found another job, but I now could not pay for the car that I had, I'm getting rid of the car. I'm not going to take a second job to keep a car that I can't afford. That car no longer fits in my 40 hours. Y'all. There are two times in your life. Listen now. I'm going to say this and I got to move on. Two times in your life you can be debt free. See, y'all don't even know what I'm about to say. Look at you. <laughs> I'm being serious and y'all playing. One is every month when you sit down and write your checks. Once all the bills are paid, you're debt free. Am I right about it? You're all trying to figure it out. No. When I pay that la write that last check, I don't know anybody anything. Till next month. Now listen, listen. No, no, no. I am debt free because if somewhere between, you know, that, that fifth of the month I write that last check 
and the first of the next month I die, I, ain't, I don't want nobody or nothing. Amen. The second time you're debt free is when all your, your bills are paid in full. That means you don't, you don't have any installments. Listen to me. You don't ever reach that level. You won't pay the gas company, electric company. You won't pay somebody every month. Okay? But if you pay them on time, you're debt free. All right. One more thing you don't have to worry about, see? No, no, see? Okay, I got, I got six minutes. I need to do this, all right? The Bible says that, uh, 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 that when we are ineffective or unfruitful, it's because we have rested on past achievements. You know how we do that? We always talk about what the Lord did in our life. Very seldom do we talk about what the Lord is doing. We always talk about what he did. Amen? The Bible teaches us that our faith must go beyond what we just believe. Oh, what? How can I go beyond my belief? The Bible says it must become of what, a part of what we do. If you are just talking about what you believe, but you never have any corresponding action, then the Bible tells us that that's not faith. Amen? So, uh, <clears throat> salvation does not depend on positive character traits that we just talked about uh, and good works, but it does depend, I mean, it does produce in us those characters and qualities. In other words, if I want to have godliness, then I have to practice godliness until it becomes a part of my life, and then it adds to my salvation. Are you following me? Amen. Amen. So a person who claims to be saved without changing does not understand faith of what God has done. Now, you can't forget where you were when you got saved. Because there was something in your life that was wrong that you figured out, I need some help with. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's why you got saved. Amen. Now, the only way that you can go back to sinning is you forgot what you were doing when you got saved. Amen. Now, that means that everybody needs to go back to remembering baptism. Now, listen now. There's a charge that we give when we baptize you. And it goes something like this. Having confessed your faith in Christ. You remember that? And then it talks about uh, cleansing you from all sin. That means your past sin. huh? And then it talks about immersing you in that. And we raise you up in the newness of life. Which means that everything that happened before you got saved is in the water. Amen. Gone. Amen. Done. Right? So why is it that every now and then something will sneak up? Well, springtime this is a perfect analogy. Springtime. How many of you have grass? If you don't, wait about, about another three weeks. It'll start popping up, right? You'll go out there with the lawnmower and go, what you going to do? Cut it. And guess what's going to happen next week? It's coming back. Now, then come around November, December, what happens to that grass? That's what we say. It died, but it don't. It's dormant waiting for you. <laughs> and see, there's the seed is in the ground. So the grass has a, a mind of its own. It just keeps coming back. The seed is in the ground. Sin is in man. And no matter how we try to eradicate it, it just keeps popping his head up. 
So every time we had to do the whack-a-mole thing, every time it pops a head up, we cut it off. Somebody say, well, how do you cut it all off? Well, you got to go to heaven. Now, <laughs> but there's so much stuff that, that, that you need to get rid of right here on earth. Amen. <laughs> oh, Lord, here you go again. I tell you. So he says this. He says, listen, <laughs> if you don't understand what God has done, uh, then you'll go back to your past sins. But he says the contrast is this. He says uh, that the believer who is increasing in these qualities is, is contrasted by the other believer who lacks these things. He says he's nearsighted and blind. Literally, this means that he's blind being nearsighted. Now, y'all don't know what that means. I wear glasses. I know what that means. When I get tired of y'all, I just do this. Somebody say, what does that mean? I can't see who out. Now, now, listen, that's what the Bible says, nearsighted mean near, nearsighted mean blind. You have to see it up close. In other words, in other words, if you if you move it away from it, it changes. What we do is we see things according to the world system. And what does that mean? It means up close. Somebody say up close. No, no, no. It's up close. It's personal. Heaven is way up beyond that. So we try to see things from God's perspective by looking at the world. And sometimes that messes us up because the world is the opposite of what we should be imitating. Even the good people aren't good enough for God. That's why he wants them saved. So he says you're, you're, you're nearsighted. Amen. Now, what that means is this. It means, <laughs> Lord, this is good. It means that uh, the word short-sighted, it's muopazo. It means uh, to blink or to shut one's eyes. Life of Christ, mm. causing spiritual blindness. Mm. Now, this happens quite frequently. Mm. You know how you close your eyes spiritually mm. and go in the liquor store. <laughs> you get ready to go to the club. You look around outside to see if you see Jesus anywhere. You don't see it, you close your eyes and go in. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? The Bible says, <laughs> we close our eyes to things we don't want to see. If God is showing us something that we don't want to see in order to keep from having to be obedient to the thing he's showing us, we just blink. Whew, boy, that went away, thank God. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And too often, this is what we do in church. We close our eyes to the thing that God is showing us right in front of us. Usually your brother or your sister. And we pretend that we don't see him. The Bible says short-sighted means to feel your way or to grope as a blind man does. I like that feel your way because that's how we do. We feel our way through life. How do I, how do I feel today? How am I feeling about that person? How am I feeling about that thing? Amen. A person who gropes and feels don't know where they're supposed to be going. Amen. Because God is the light that is directing you 
Oh, you know, y'all, y'all hear what I'm saying. <sighs> the Bible says that he has no uh, uh, moral vision. Can't see what's right and what's wrong. And see, a lot of folk in church today, don't, they can't tell what's right or, who, or what's wrong because they made so many rules that don't have anything to do with Christ. Huh? Amen. Now, you don't, don't, you know, I don't want to talk about legalism because I'm out of time, so I need to finish what I'm talking about. But if I had time, I would tell you that, you know, I said on Tuesday, I, I fired my church police. Y'all can worship in peace up in here. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Amen. So the Bible says that a defective moral vision is uh, people who forget the cleansing of their past sins. And see, this is the thing. You don't want to repeat the sins. So don't act like you forgot. Don't, don't act like you forgot. Huh? You don't want to go back there. You say, I, I remember. I did that. It didn't work out. I ain't going back there no more. Amen. So the unsaved person is in the dark because Satan has blinded his mind. And 2 Corinthians tells us that. And uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, verse uh, four verses three and four uh, it says that but even if our gospel is veiled it's veiled to those who are perishing so unsaved people they you know the gospels it's, it's not there for them it's non-existent whose minds the God of his age has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of, of Christ uh, who is the image of God should shine on them so that is the main reason why people are having a difficult time and this is where I close this is where people have a difficult time coming into the kingdom because a person whose mind has been blinded cannot see the kingdom. That's why John 3 says, Jesus answered him, most assuredly I say to you, unless you are born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And too many people are not born again. They can't see the kingdom. They can only see their own self-righteousness. Amen? So the Bible says then, that uh, after our eyes open, it's important that we increase our vision so that we can see what God wants us to see. And this is the problem we have is that we don't see what God wants us to see. We want to see what we think God sees. Amen. Amen. That's why we want to be religious. Hmm? We go out and we do stuff. We do we, we, we do. Uh, uh, what I call comfortable evangelism. Find somebody that you can talk to that's, you know, easy going and then slip something in about Christ. Amen. But we go home to people in our own house that's unsaved. That's why you had to slip it in when you're out of the house because you're not comfortable with where you are in the house. Are y'all with me? Revelations 3.17, I'm through with this. It says, uh, talking about the church of Laodicea, uh, Laodicea, and it says this, it says, because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Huh? Yeah, that sounds like some folk I know. And do not know that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Amen. So here's the last word on that. If we forget what God has done for us, we will not be excited to share Christ with others. Amen. I believe that every single person has to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ if they expect change that come in their life. And today, I want to just share real, real quick what I believe needs to happen, especially in the time that we're living in. We have to get a hold of all the folks who are disaffected as Christians 
And we have to tell them that there are only two options, heaven or hell. Listen, Christ or Satan. These are the only options. We have to make sure that everybody understands that just because your lifestyle is jacked up doesn't mean that salvation is not working. We're going to have to speak to those people who were once born again. Listen, people who were part of this church, people who were part of other churches, people who made that vow to Christ when they were baptized and then they walked away. We're going to have to tell them that there's only two choices. They're going to have to make a choice. Now, here's what I say. And I told the folks last night, I'm selling fire insurance. I'm selling fire insurance. What is he talking about? I want you to know that you can avoid hell. Listen to me. Even if you're not living as a saint, you can still avoid hell by maintaining a relationship to Christ. Now, 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 how, how do you do that? Here's what I tell people all the time. Listen, if you stay in church, you stay in the word, your behavior will eventually turn. But if you have no connection, then you can't change. But because of the word of God that we have received, the Bible says that Romans 8, 37, we have been made more than conquerors. We are overcomers. So I'm speaking to all those people. Are they still on out there? I'm going to tell them all. You can still come back and you can get you some insurance just in case that other stuff don't work out. Just in case you can come back to Christ. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Come on, stand up on your feet. Supplementing your faith. Hey, family, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for making it all the way to this point in the service. But before we get out of here, there might be somebody who has not yet had the opportunity to accept Christ as their personal savior. I want to take this time to extend that opportunity to you right now. It's as simple as ABC. First, admit that you're a sinner. Secondly, believe that Christ died for your sins. And thirdly, confess that he is Lord over your life. Listen, this is something that everybody can do. It is very simple. All you have to do is join us in this prayer. All right, you ready? Here we go. Father, forgive me, a sinner. I have missed the mark, but I thank you for your shed blood that's able to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for raising from the dead for me. Thank you for making a way for me. So I now confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, family, welcome. Welcome to the family, the kingdom family. It's a family like no other. Listen, let me tell you something. This family it will never turn your back, turn its back on you. This family will never leave you high and dry. And to prove that, I need you to text SAVED to this number down here at the bottom of the screen. Please make sure you text SAVED to this number if you pray this prayer with us today. We want to take connect you with um, the uh, someone who can help you further this faith journey.
because it is definitely a journey. It's not something to be taken lightly, and it's not something you should have to do by yourself. We want to connect you with a devotional. We want to encourage you on a day-to-day basis in this faith walk, and if you're not connected with the local church, we want to help you get connected with the local church. It doesn't have to be our church. We're not about growing our church. We're about growing the kingdom. So wherever you are, even if you're here in New Bern and you need a church, reach out to us. We'll help you get connected with some place where you can grow and continue on this faith journey. That's all we want to see happen. All right, guys, thank you so much for rocking with us today. We have enjoyed having you. Um, You guys have an amazing week. And just by chance, if your week is not so amazing, make sure it has an amazing you in it. God bless you. We love you. And we can't wait to see you next time.